Dr. Kim's books in my classes, such as Healing Our Broken Humanity, Planetary Solidarity, Intercultural Ministry, Making Peace with the Earth, and Embracing the Other. Doesn't that sound like somebody you just love to hang out with? And uh, I actually have the privilege this week of hanging out with Dr. Kim. And the reason is that she's accepted our invitation to be the editor of the seventh volume in our 10 volume series. This is volume two, Christianity in North Africa and West Asia. But we're going to do a volume on North America and Dr. King Kim will be the editor of that volume. And uh, we have a, actually a special guest here I wanted to introduce uh, because we're working on this together and that is Dr. Kenneth Ross, who's here in the front row. Ken, would you stand? <laughs> Ken is a senior research associate at our center, but he lives in Malawi. And he actually came from Malawi through Geneva and London uh, to be with us here as we plan this seventh volume. Now back to Dr. Kim. She's included in the Englewood Review of Books list of 10 important women theologians that you should be reading. So it fits really well with our theme this month, and really every month we should be doing this. And, and their list of books to read under Our God is Too White, question mark, diversifying our theology. Uh, Dr. Kim is an ordained minister of word and sacrament within the PC USA denomination. She's married to Dr. Perry Lee, who teaches mathematics, isn't that great? And they have three children, Theo, Elizabeth, and Joshua. Dr. Kim, would you come and speak with us? Birth 
to my kids. And it's not easy raising them. But four years ago, I took my oldest to Korea. And then I left him there. <laughs> he wanted to stay, so I left him there all summer. And I said, please call mom. Do you think he ever called mom? So I'm calling him all the time. Every time I call him, he's like, I'm in a rush. I said, what are you in a rush for? He stayed at Yonsei University, and they like shut down at 10 o'clock or something. So if he doesn't get there by 10 p.m., he's locked up. So he said, I can't talk to you right now. I'm in a rush. <laughs> so I said, call me. Call mommy when you are free. He's there all summer long. Three days before, he's coming home. <laughs> he calls me, and I'm like so excited. I said, oh my goodness, my son is calling me. <laughs> so I'm like, I can't even, like, and I'm fumbling with my phone because I'm so excited. I'm like, I'm going to drop it. And I slide it over, and I say, hello. And the next thing he says is, mom, I have no more money. <laughs> And he doesn't know the past code. He's like, Mom, I have no money. What is my past code? And I said, I can barely remember my own past code. How would I know your past code? I said, the only person that will remember your past code is your dad. So anyway, so he called his dad. But that's the only time he ever called me. So. You guys on Women's History Month, but as every month, you know, as you said, every month, every every day of the year, you should remember your mother <laughs> and all the women. So we have a lot of women faculty in in Gordon Conwell, and I think that's wonderful that you know more and more seminaries we're hiring more women, and that more women students are coming. Now, this is so exciting for me because, and I'm going to share a bit of my story. You know, I went to the seminary in the 90s, and you think 90s wasn't that long ago, but anyway, it was a long time ago, and a lot has happened since the 90s. And at that time, if, you, if a woman went to seminary, you would say, why? <laughs> why are you? And, you know, I got that throughout my whole MDiv and my whole PhD program. And even after I got it, people just couldn't accept me as someone who can teach. So that's always been a challenge for me. You know, how can you teach? So today's passage, I thought someone was going to read it, but I'll read it. I have a Bible passage. I haven't got the PowerPoint. You guys are so high tech here. Like, I've got this huge contraption on my head. <laughs> I've never seen such a contraption. I've seen it one year, but not this head thing. So if I look a little weird, it's just, I feel awkward with this head contraption. But the passage I, uh, that I had, I don't know if it has on the PowerPoint, is from Matthew 13, 31 to 32. So you can find it on your phone. <laughs> You know, what did we do? Like, some of you are so young, you don't know when we didn't have a cell phone. But I'm like, what did we do before the cell phone? Because I need my cell phone beside me. Like, when I'm preaching, <laughs> when I'm teaching, when I'm sleeping, just in case. You know? But, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we got cell phones. But I, I remember, you know, this is more of a, of a camera to me than my phone, but I need like my whole album, just in case I have to show someone a picture of what I did a year ago. <laughs> so this is an amazing thing. So find it on your cell phone or whatever Bible that you have. So Matthew 13, 31 to 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest, of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. 
The other passage is Mark 4, 30 to 32. Gospel of Mark 4, 30 to 32. What shall we say the kingdom of heaven is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you can plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. When such big branches, with such big branches, that the birds of the air can perch and make shade. So the mustard seed, it says it's one of the smallest seeds in the world. Now I live in this neighborhood and my neighbors all think like either I never leave the house or I'm never in the house, like I'm never home. Because I'm never outside the house. So I've got neighbors who are just, you know, walking their dogs or out in the backyard enjoying their time. But for me, every time I'm outside, I either get bit alive or the sun just scorches me and I get an allergic reaction. So that's why I'm not outside. But my husband is outside because I make him go outside <laughs> to do all the gardening. <laughs> out there all the time. So I don't know, neighbors think I hibernate all the time or I'm like a slave driver making my husband work. It's just because I can't go out there. So we got this nice lovely garden and I tell them every year what to plant and how to plant it, how to water it, how to prune it. I tell them everything because I am such a good delegator. <laughs> my whole life I just delegate everybody what to do. So I actually know nothing about gardening, but in my head I know everything. <laughs> so I tell him what to do. And last year, he didn't listen to me. <laughs> because our crop was really, really bad. And I kept telling him, you're watering too much. And him and I argued, we argued about everything, but we argued about that. And at the end of the summer, we hardly had anything. I said to him, too much water. <laughs> so now we're going to see what happens this summer. What happens, how much plant. And I told him, it's too much water. Too much. He's watering. Like he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and can't wait to water the garden. <laughs> and then by midday, he can't wait to go water it again. I said, it's too much water. You're going to kill the plant. You're going to kill the plant. But here in the Bible, there's so many passages about harvesting and growing and everything else. Today it's about the mustard seed. So I've never planted a mustard seed, and I've never told my husband to plant a mustard seed. But it says it's the smallest seed, and it's going to grow into this huge plant. When I think about it, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? When I think about my own life, you know, I immigrated. I was born in Korea, and I know there's a lot of Korean students here. I looked on the Gordon Carmel website, and there's like some Korean society or something. Is there? Maybe it's a secret society. Because <laughs> we secretly want to rule the world. world. So I, know that. I know there's some Korean American fellowship or something. But I immigrated, I was born in Korea, I immigrated in the 70s to Canada. I was a really small kid, and, and starting kindergarten, you know, I didn't know how to speak English. Everybody made fun of me. And, you know, I don't know how to speak English very well, and they called me names. And then they kept asking me. So in the 70s in Canada, if you can imagine, some of you are too young. They kept saying to me, what are you? So I said, I'm Korean. And these little Korean kids kept saying, there's no such thing as Korean. I think America will be a little different because you guys went into a war, right? You were, you were part of the Korean War. So maybe some American kids would know about Korea. 
Right? And you guys grew up with math. Right? <laughs> And that many, many women's stories are lost. And we think, as women, we're so small. What can we do? What can we do as an immigrant who experienced so much racism, xenophobia everywhere? You know, a few years ago when on United Air, when that Chinese doctor was speaking up, you remember that? When he was beaten up and pulled out of his seat? My son, that never called me, he actually called me. <laughs> and he says, Mom, are you going to write about that? Because he knows I write about a lot of things. He gets me to write because, and then even after, you know, Parasite won, and I thought, you know, I watched Parasite, the movie Parasite. 
Actually, my son kept telling me it's such a scary movie. I I didn't watch it. And then the night of the Oscars was the night I was actually flying to Vegas. So I'm on this long flight. There's nothing to watch. So I go to the foreign category. The only foreign movie in there on United Air was Parasite. So I thought, okay, I'll just watch it. I know my son said I'm gonna get scared, but I'll watch it. <laughs> It was so entertaining to me. I'm like, why did my son say it was, it was going to be scary? You see, I turned it on too late, but I, the last 25 minutes I couldn't watch it. It's the last 25 minutes that's scary, right? Because I had to get off the plane, and then the Oscars happened, and they won. And then, so, I, go, I texted my daughter, I said, where can I watch it for free? Because she knows all the free sites. I watched the rest of it. <laughs> I watched the rest of it, and that's when it was scary, right? <laughs> so if you didn't watch it, you have to watch it. And then so the next day, my son said, are you going to write about it? I said, I'm not going to write about it. I'm in Vegas. What am I going to write about? But then because he said that, I wrote about it. So if you want to read my writing, it's on the Christian Century, on Parasite. But that day when he asked me, are you going to write about it, when that Chinese doctor was beaten up, I was going to write about it, but I couldn't write about it. Why? Because it was so close to my own experiences. My parents had a variety store, as many of the immigrants did, Korean American immigrants. And I've seen people, customers come in. I look tall, actually I was taller than, uh, because I just met my friend and we were the same height and I shrunk two inches over the years. I was actually taller than I am now, but my dad is really short. He's like probably five two. He's a really short man. Customers beat him up. Customers got a bottle of water and just threw it at him. And you wonder why. There's no reason they just did it and they thought it was funny. Because it's easy to do it to people that are the other, or who you make the other. So that time when that happened, I couldn't write it because it was too personal. So when we think about society and we, the, the American country, you know, racism and sexism happening, we ask ourselves, what can we do? as Christians. The passage was, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed when a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. And becomes a tree, so the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. We may be sitting here thinking, oh, it's so small. What can I do? You know, I'm a minority, or I'm a woman, or I'm so young. What can I do? You know, there's stories, of fantastic stories of what women in the past and other people have done in the past. You know, there was a young woman from Albania who was teaching and then she decided to go to India to serve the poorest of the poor. Right? And then she started, she set up a place to help those who are homeless, those who are dying, those who had leprosy, who had illness. I actually visited that place in India. It's missionaries of charity. And the woman is mother. And then she started in 1950 with 12 members. She's actually a very tiny woman. I never met her. It was my hope and dream to meet her. I never met her. Today, there's over 4,500 4, members. Now, there are homes and places around the world, over 133 countries where these places, missionaries.